Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this section where we follow up the expert sessions before lunch and dive into manufacturing and automotive. My name is Magnus Karlsson and I'm CTO of Insights and Data in Sweden. We are only in the beginning of the AI revolution for all industries, but in manufacturing and automotive it's even more early days. I will tell you now a little bit about why it is. The first thing is that there is an abundance of data in manufacturing automotive. It's true for all industries, but in automotive and manufacturing, we have around 70% of all data is not used at all. More than for any industry. This according to several studies by research institutes and universities. And there's another big factor, and that's the um, democratization of advanced AI. So far, the most profound impact of AI has been in the business to consumer applications, where there have been uh, a very large millions of customers of data available and very big budgets to spend on these applications. This uh, type of budgets and uh, ca capital has not been available in the business-to-business -business applications uh, before. But now we are seeing that it's possible to realize complex uh, business cases much faster with lower budgets and with less technical experience. This enables the long tail of use cases to be realized. For instance, if you have a bunch of use cases, you can realize for as low as 500,000 euro, and you have a 10, e 10 times uh, payback for each of them, it's a huge potential. Another important factor is uh, with this huge amount of data available, Will you innovate by yourself or will you look at the whole ecosystem that you're a part of? In fact, the ability share, to share and use data in the whole industrial ecosystem has been identified as a key competitive factor in a study for the World Economic Forum. In our first session, we will take a deeper look into this. And then, of course, the hype around generative AI. Uh, this year has, or 2023, have been an intensive year of innovation and hype around Gen AI. We will have two sessions in the program diving into generative AI and innovation in generative AI. So, this is the agenda for this afternoon. We will start up with collaborative data ecosystems and uh, our speaker from Arne Rosterman. Then we will go to a session on how Polestar implement AI and we will have the speaker Thomas talking. And then we have the two sections around generative AI. First, a section from Microsoft where they talk about what they've learned from applying generative AI during this hectic year. And we went and will end up with a session on innovation on generative AI with our own Major Young from Capgemini. So, but enough talking from me. Now I will introduce our first speaker, Arne Rossman from Capgemini, expert on collaborative data ecosystems. Hey, Welcome. Marcus. Hey, Marcus. Nice to be here. Nice to have you here. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. <coughs> hey, and welcome to my presentation about the collaborative data ecosystem. I will show how the automotive industry in Europe uh, is building the value together and learning from the participation in the initiatives around GAIX and CATINAX. You might remember the famous quote by Clive Humby uh, from 2006, um, data is the new oil. But I don't like that. I think data is not the new oil. It's more like the sun. Data is not finite. I can have it, you can have it, and we can create new data, and uh, we don't need to pollute the environment with it. And it's all more like the <coughs> Almans Retten, 
the nature is shared with everyone. So it's better for us that we think about sharing the data just to simply collect them, because that gives us the unique competitive advantage. When we look into the data ecosystem, it feels like the, the internet moment, but happening much faster. So we remember the old 90s, we thought about, okay, is that website really something? E-commerce, will it really be important? But then in, in the uh, early 20s, uh, we uh, accomplished that the e-retail has a business of more than $4 trillion. All the big companies uh, from Fang uh, are valued more than $7 um, trillion. And the stationary business, like Toys R Us, um, Sears and, and uh, Kmart, went bankrupt. And if you look to the data ecosystem world, so 2021, everyone was asking, is it really something with data? Is that data ecosystem important? Can I do something with it? And if we look now, it's expected that the Apple Health is a one trillion ecosystem um, with the potential of reducing the overall supply chain carbon footprint by 40%. So you see the data ecosystem is a massive opportunity, but also an existing threat to your own business. But why does it matter? Um, there's a lot of potential we can see um, around um, the, the data ecosystem. So first of all, you have the, the possibility around process integration. You can easily integrate with your suppliers and your partner ecosystem. Uh, and with that one, sharing the information, for instance, on ESG-related topics. And with that, it gives you the opportunity for cost reduction, because you need to share this information either way. And it's much better and much cheaper to do this via an established data platform than with any other uh, of these um, um, systems you could have. So the TCO um, of uh, keeping an old environment like EDA interfaces is not really good. And by joining that data sharing principles, there's also the potential of data monetization because now you have the possibility to, to gain additional revenue streams with it. And um, that gives, for instance, the example of uh, Mercedes-Benz. They expect to have um, out of the um, subscription services, 2 billion euros of revenue by 2025. So you see the data ecosystem, especially the collaborative ecosystem, is a huge potential. And we will look into this a bit more. Coming from a data platform perspective, oh, you already know there are a lot of possibilities how you can share the data. You have these standard connectors and the, the platforms like from Snowflake, from, from Azure, from AWS, but also dedicated APIs, uh, you have the possibilities. So there's a lot of things um, you need to think about. So what are we going to share and how? But there's also the question on why do we want to share? What's our purpose with it? What do we want to achieve with sharing the data? And that's exactly the right point in time to use the data strategy canvas to take a step back and ask uh, yourself on many of the questions and give answers to them. And here, the data strategy canvas helps you to structure your thoughts in coming to the right strategy. When it's about um, the what to share, uh, we, we already have it uh, some years back. Um, that was really the, we shared the data in uh, not not really reproducible way, send it via email, the standard Excel sheets, which has been shared via email and um, sent via USB stick. That was the early days, but that was really low value because I couldn't integrate it. The next stage was with the file shares. Uh, we set up dedicated file shares, SFTP uploads, downloads, where we shared the information with our partners and gives us the first additional value because um, you could create automatic processes out of it. And next one was then really on the, the standard frameworks. So for instance, all the cloud hyperscalers, including also um, Snowflake, but also Databricks, they have formats 
integrators um, and services how to share the data from the platform on towards your participants. And that's really a big um, step ahead because uh, it was already integrated and so you don't need to um, deal with these integrations. But even better way is to think from the API portal way because it usually integrates everything you have below but gives you additional opportunities for the developers and for the partners to integrate uh, into the processes and create custom process integration. Well, there's a much higher business value. And finally, um, the collaborative ecosystem. What we see, especially in Europe, with um, the Gaia-X and prominently um, the Catena-X initiatives around automotive. But there's not only increase in the business value but there's also an increase in uh, the complexity and the maturity required um, for that to implement. So better take a stepwise approach. When we look into the Catena X, um, there we can already learn something. It's a, it's a huge ecosystem usually integrated with all of your um, so, um, potential partners coming from the R&D partners, coming supplier, um, down to the logistics partners, and finally also, uh, especially when we think about the circular economy on the recycling. So everyone is joining that ecosystem, and I would like to give you two examples on, on the benefits of such a ecosystem. The first one, and you remember that you already have to do it, is on quality reporting. Because you usually get your material from one of your suppliers and then you create that quality checks and you want to report back to your suppliers on that lightest batch that they are able to improve and um, also have the right numbers um, on, on their KPI. So that's something that you already need to do. And uh, next one we already see is on the overall supply chain carbon footprint, especially looking from the required ESG reporting, but also on the material source. Uh, looking from the overall supply chain um, safely sources of the material and resources. And it's better to do this via the, such a collaborative ecosystem than to create every time another custom component on sharing this information or sharing PDF files via email. But as Catena X is the most advanced um, uh, example within the uh, Gaia X ecosystem, we already see some of the challenges the company face. The first one is on the compliance and the legal, because you need to think about how can I share the information in a compliant and secure way to maintain the overall security and data privacy. And you also need to look into the uh, opt-ins and uh, the required approvals from all the parties you need to get. The second one is on the data engineering, because you need to translate the requirements from the business into data product and then finally into sharing the data. And usually that also requires the mapping and the transformation into some kind of digital twin shape. And that's really um, necessary to, to, to have that overall integration and process improvement happening. And that leads uh, finally to uh, the question of the technology standards. Because, for instance, the data space connector is not simply just one component uh, you need to integrate. It's multiple components you need to integrate into your platform to fully leverage the potential and to fully connect to the ecosystem. And with that, the overall and the overarching observability comes really prominent. But that not only challenges what we see uh, with the Catena X integration, but also a lot of opportunities. So, for instance, as I said, the integration into Digital Twin gives you the opportunity to build up semantic uh, ontologies and creation and uh, advancement towards the Digital Twin. And finally, being able to provide apps into the marketplace and um, monetize data. So, looking back, um, there's a huge opportunity with joining collaborative ecosystem. And I would like to summarize now um, the three 
key learnings. First of all, sharing the data is the key for future competitive advantage. Because without joining um, such initiatives and without sharing the data, you will lose traction and you have to do it everything by your own. Second one, Catena X is the most mature ecosystem within the Gaia X, which has right now more than 170 members. And the next one on manufacturing and further are arising. So that's really that ecosystem to join. And last but not least, um, on the question where to start, start with the data sharing strategy using the data strategy canvas because you need to answer the question on why, the what, and the how to get the right way. So thanks a lot for joining that session and um, hope to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Arne. I guess uh, super interesting and uh, I think we have time for at least one question. Yes. I know uh, one thing is, is your own data, but how do you sort of create value from other organizations' data? Yeah, thanks, Magnus. Uh, good question. So the answer is really into um, the data um, ecosystem in the marketplace, because there's the one-shop place where you can look on what data is available, from what vendor, from a partner, and how I can use it. So you get the information on the structure and the purpose and how you can use it into your own organization. Super good. Uh, maybe we can do a follow up then on that. I think we, we how do you balance collaboration and comp competition? Yeah, that's a good question because um, you need to look uh, the, uh, into the ecosystem. Everyone can see the data you are sharing, but also that gives you a lot of opportunities because, mm. for instance, on combining the efforts on um, working on um, combined um, orders, for instance, on, on rare materials or on, on rare spare parts. So especially during the COVID times, we have seen it, and that gives us the joint forces and competitive advantage here. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Uh, super interesting, and thank you. Thanks, Magnus. And uh, now it's uh, time for our next speaker. It's from Polestar, but let's start with a movie. That was a cool movie. Welcome, Thomas Arneson from Polestar. Uh, the stage is yours to tell, tell us about what you're doing in AI. Thank you, Magnus. Happy to be here. Hi, my name is Thomas, and I'm head of data analytics at Polestar. Polestar is an electric performance car brand with HQ here in Gothenburg. Polestar is a fairly new company. We were founded six, seven years ago, and I've joined uh, four years ago. Today, I will present an example in how we aim to use AI in improving our customer experience, and also my thoughts on this new transformation in data and AI. But let's start with the data. There is a lot of it. In Polestar, we basically have three types of data. We have business data, consumer data, and car data. And today I will focus in on a use case. The use cases are many, but today I will zoom in a bit on consumer data and the use case coming from our customer insight and analytics department. At Polestar, we offer a premium customer experience with the principle of digital first, human always. Due to our direct-to-consumer model, our customer care team supports the customer along the entire journey 
from buying to owning a Polestar. Today we have over 100,000 customers and as this number increases, our customer care cases also increases. To be able to handle this as we scale our brand and at the same time maintaining a personal touch, we, we need to work smarter. We asked ourselves, what if we could use AI technology to help us scale this? What if we could Im uh, improve case handling by using AI technology in a way that it gives faster response responses, more consistent responses, and increases the overall customer satisfaction? So what did we do? We started to train a model on our internal uh, knowledge base uh, and also on previous anonymized customer care cases. We also trained the model in the Polestar tone of voice, local adaptations in language and various do's and don'ts. So how does this look in real life? On the left side, we see a customer care case and in the middle, we see a reply made by one of our agents. And then on the right side, we see what kind of response that our AI would generate. Our goal was then to enable this as an option for our customer care agents to be able to use in their day-to-day -day work, to copy and modify before sending out and answering a customer. What about the results? It was very clear from the beginning that this would save time for our agents. Over almost 70% of the agents that participated uh, estimated that they will save time and about three to four minutes per case. So if you do the math, around 30,000 cases would generate 175 working days per year that could be spent on more important tasks. By using AI, we did not only save time. We also saw positive effect of the quality of the responses and the overall customer satisfaction. In addition to delivering value, I would say that the main key takeaway from this project was that we actually involved people and not the technology itself. We proved that it works and we took away the fear of AI from individuals and our teams. At Polestar, our mantra is digital first, human always. And it's important to understand that AI is not here to replace us, but to help us. For example, saving time that we can spend on more important tasks and value adding activities. So what are my personal thoughts on this business transformation in data and AI? I see three key things, people, processes, and platforms. There are many things in this. Um, here are some points. Uh, here is a good, I will not go through all of them. So here is maybe a good idea to take a screenshot, but let's start with people. When I think of data and AI and people, the first that comes to mind is, okay, how many data engineers do I need? How many data scientists do, do I need? That's my first thought. But I would recommend instead focusing on the business users, since the business users are cl the closest ones to the business value and they are the ones that needs to be involved. You need to find your business champions and together seek executive sponsorship. Secondly, processes. Governance is getting more and more complex. We have security, privacy, access management, auditing, monitoring, data quality, and now also responsible and compliant AI. Upcoming regulations means that you need to invest and stay ahead of, of the curve with your data governance processes. You need to keep it simple, but ground rules are fundamental and people need to understand what policies that exist and how they should follow them. 
Standardization is also a key enabler to make sure easy to use frameworks are created. You need to find a balance between minimizing risk and not holding back innovation. And the third one, last but not least, platforms. How many platforms do you have? What technologies do you use today? How do they integrate with each other? In Polestar, we currently have three data platforms. We have an operational data platform, we have an analytical data platform, and we have a master data platform. You need a very solid foundation for your data and to have your lake houses in order to ensure delivery of secure delivery uh, and also cost deficient delivery of high quality data. Those are some of my key takeaways and I hope to find them useful and that you um, got, got some insights from Polestar and our transformation in data and AI. Thank you. Super good. Very interesting. I think we have time for a question as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Polestar, as you said, it's a new company with little legacy. How would you say that uh, affect the way you develop and implement AI? I think it affects us quite a lot. And actually, if we go back to my three takeaways, people, processes and platform, and that's where I see some change. So people, um, without legacy, people are very open minded in general to new technology. Uh, when it comes to processes, that can be both a positive and a negative, but maybe the lack of processes can help speed. So speed is a factor here in going to production. And the last one, platforms. Um, when having legacy in terms of platforms, you may be stuck on old uh, technological legacy and data platforms, and it may take quite some time to adapt them into the new ways of data platforms. Cool. So you're allowed to do a lot of things at, at Polestar, I guess. Then. Yes. Yeah. Uh, freedom is good. Yes. Uh, but you, now it was customer service. Mm. Um, wh what do you think would be the next area to be enhanced with AI? Well, we're here, automotive, so car is the obvious one. Yeah. Uh, but I think apart from that, for us at least, it's a lot about personalization and actually delivering a premium customer experience. And that includes having uh, a personalized service everywhere you are. Mm. So I see that as the next thing. So we will see more of that. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Super interesting and nice to have you here. Thank you. Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next are two speakers from one of the giants in Gen AI, Microsoft. Welcome, Jonas and Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to have you here. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to listening to what you have to say about the AI developments of last year. This, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good. I'm Caroline Atilius. I oversee the manufacturing and automotive teams for Microsoft Sweden. And with me today, I have... Jonas Dahlberg, the sales director for data and AI also at Microsoft Sweden. Good. And we're here to share some experiences from... Uh, I think the past year has been a super busy year in terms of AI. Uh, it's, been, it's been mad. We expected it to, to, to like really deteriorate or stop being mad, but it's still crazy. Yeah. And great, I love it. And great fun, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It's great fun. So uh, the idea of today is to share some experiences from the, early, from the early days in generative AI, which has now grown into the more mature days of AI. So we have a couple of customer examples. Um, in manufacturing and automotive, I think quite a few of the customers were early on. They experimented a lot in early yeah. stages, and they've come now to a, to a stage where you can really see mature and measurable outcomes. So hopefully today we can share some perspectives from, from yep. this. Uh, and when you and I spoke prior to this, uh, Jonas, we discussed a bit on where do we really see AI taking effect in the manufacturing and automotive domain. And what we see here are uh, broader examples of applicable um, customer stories and examples that we've been working with for the past year. And we also then came to a conclusion that there are four areas that are a bit more ahead of the curve than others, which then sums up to smart factory operations. So 
I think predictive and preventive maintenance has been around for quite some time. Yeah, but something happened with GNI. Definitely. We're adding another layer of intelligence. We're adding other layers of automation than what we've seen before. So we'll come back on that example. Uh, we also have in-vehicle experience. So from an automotive standpoint, this can also have the ability to completely change the in-vehicle experience. We'll tap into some of those. Um, we discussed streamlining processes and business processes all up. So uh, in here we said legal, HR and IT, but it also goes across sales and marketing and, and all our um, uh, operational layers as well. Uh, we have some measurable outcomes that we should discuss in one of the cases there. And the last one would be the personalized customer experience. So how do we build more uh, and differentiated customer experience with the support of, of AI? So that's what we aim to cover a bit today. And first example being brought up uh, would be the Mercedes case. And this was actually launched a couple of months ago, so quite early. It is um, built on Azure Open AI uh, components. And um, after Mercedes launched this, we've also been working with TomTom and a few of the other uh, giants in, in the in-vehicle space uh, to provide more personalized experiences. This one, I would say, sums up to three main points. So the first one is being able to create a more natural uh, experience when talking in the car. Mm -hmm. So instead of having voice controlled, which has been the standard for quite a few years, when you need to say the exact right words at the exact ti same mm. time to get uh, the results you want. Now you can use natural voice and you can actually get the, the answers. Uh, the second part of this would be um, to personalize the context, meaning you can, for example, ask for directions to where you're heading, but you can also ask for information around that direction. So now I'm heading to, I'm passing by Westeros. If I want to grab something to eat, where should I go? Where's the least busy place? Where's the best restaurant and so on? And the third uh, piece of this is also integrating this to a broader API um, ecosystem. So in the long run, what this would enable is, for example, to make ticket reservations and have your car actually act as a personal assistant. So all these things are now being evaluated in this new type of in-vehicle experiences. And we see some really interesting results coming through from, from the early beta programs. So this will for sure change the way that we view automotive moving forward. The second example set up was Epiroc. Yeah, mm. and I think this is a very good example of what happens with, um, with uh, factor operations. Uh, they had issues with steel quality. They have the manufacturing all across the world and the, the issue with steel quality was something that, that cost them money. It uh, affected uh, quality and, and customer experience. So what they did was that they set up or, or basically reuse the sensors they had on their factory floor and then applied um, AI on top of that to help um, make the quality a lot better. So I think this is an, it's a very interesting case in that it's really, the outcome is very clear to measure because mm. they had a number of quality issues before and they can now measure fewer yes. quality issues afterwards. Mm. So great case. Really good case. I, I come to think of actually, we had a couple of years back, we had similar cases with ThyssenKrupp as one example, the elevator yes. uh, right. uh, manufacturer. This was quite cumbersome still. AI was around, but it was more related to um, data quality and, and, mm. and data questions. Today, a lot of this has been optimized. So I think this one was actually made in a couple of weeks as compared yes. to other cases that took more than a year, um, That's a correct. couple of years really back. Quick. Great. Um, third example is related to then process optimization. Um, so this is a case from the Volvo Group where uh, the idea has been to target finance and customer service scenarios with they have a lot of manual effort into analyzing different type of documents. So imagine that things are being captured in uh, handwriting, in stamps, in different types of notes, and on top of that in different languages across the world. And then you hire a lot of people to sit down and do manual analysis of where do we have potential claims coming in, where will we have failures with invoicing and so on. So uh, the Volvo Group were very early on in just concluding that AI can completely 
um, completely changed the way that we that we've been viewing this process for the past 20 years. So they built a quite advanced uh, setup with different types of cognitive services and AI services. Mm -hmm. And what they've built in the end is something that in a few weeks time um, was able to save 850 man hours per month, the very first month. Mm -hmm. And since then it's been ticking. So we're up uh, over 100 um, or 10,000 hours for the time being and 100,000 uh, hours by this year's end. So this means that you can completely relocate people and have them to do more value adding pieces and use yeah. technology in your favor to do all this analysis. What we might add with this case as well, and the reason why I love it is that it's uh, the scenario in itself is extremely compatible with almost any type of business. Most businesses, whatever your what industry you're in, you have a lot of documents, you have claims, you have invoices, you have it's a uh, it's a solution pattern that can be reused across basically every industry. In this case, it's Volvo, but it could be yes. basically anyone else. Fully agree. Fully agree. Good. We have one more coming up. So this one's funny because it surprised not only us as a vendor, but also the customer. The uh, thing is, Gunnebo is working with, with uh, security, uh, mostly physical security. And this is a case that we made together with them and their innovation lab in Italy, where they spend a lot of time reading security logs. You know, really long structured documents with who entered what code and when and how and what did they do. And they spent a lot of time in the past reviewing these logs, trying to find based on, for example, at an incident, they need to create an incident report telling, you know, this is how this unauthorized person gained access to your premises, for example. They spent hours reviewing these security logs to try to find out how this happened. It turned out, uh, and quite to our surprise as well, is that the GPT models are really good at figuring out what's happening, even with very, very little context. You know, basically you say, this is a security log. Uh, it's, you know, a little bit about the format. And then you start querying it, saying, do you know why this happened in this premises at this time? And the results surprised us. And they save hours, many, many hours, every time they use this, instead of using it manually. But, but the thing is that it, it, its ability to reason over this data set actually surprised us, as well as a customer. So I think it's a cool case. It is, indeed. Good. I think we've uh, come to a wrap-up slide. We, you and I discussed a bit. I mean, what has been the learning so far and, and all up what can companies bring with them into this era of, of AI? Yeah, I think we, we came to the conclusion of three different things. I think for the first being and, and also becoming really clear on the Gunnebo case, for example, is that you need to experiment. You need to try this out because it's very dangerous to assume what works or not. Mm. So basically, I would say start small, but experiment a lot. Try it with different data sets, different contexts, different prompts, and also use different models as well. There are a lot uh, of them available. I think another thing, thing that is quite clear that, that uh, I think you brought it up when we talked about this is the how the business outcomes are critical in this case. It's, we have seen a lot of examples of, of IT-driven initiatives, etc. But if you really want to get the value out of generative AI, you need your business in line. You need to get them involved, make them ask the questions. We need help with this. This is an inefficiency we have. And then support them for, from IT because this is, it is still technology and it's fairly new. And then about new technology, I mean, obviously there's a lot of new possibilities, mm. which means that you will need new skills. I don't necessarily think that prompt engineer is the things you need. Probably before you train them, the model will probably understand what you want anyway. But still, skilling people broadly, but also specifically in this area. So experiment, focus on the business outcome, and uh, don't underestimate the skilling you need. Mm. It's a good sum up. 
I think it's I think so. We we did it, but yeah. we still like it. Yeah, it's good. I, I agree with most you. Most of the cases. Good summary. You want to come back, Magnus? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, super interesting cases, of course, and I can't avoid to. I want to ask you a, a few follow-up questions, or at least one to start with. I mean, um, <coughs> AI has been a part of different applications for quite a long time. I mean, you saw with the with the agent in the car, you have been able to talk to your car for, for before, and you you had some example where what's changed with Gen AI. But what's the most important change that that in in the experience that you get? You think? I think one thing that I did not bring up um, is actually you are used to having an in-car experience which is very much built on an, on, on you tapping yep. um, a, a couple of buttons, right? Whether that's an interactive mm. uh, screen or whether that's mm. something else. Whereas if we really go into this era, then you will have such intelligent answers mm. in just talking to your car mm. um, that it will completely um, uh, sort of make sure that your those buttons will not be needed anymore. So I think we're in the beginning of that era where that is changing. And it's probably the same when we saw the introduction of the smartphone back mm. in the days, right? People were used to clicking physical buttons and then all of a sudden they had the screen. Now we're going to the next era, which is, do we really need a screen? Can we talk? Can we can we use that screen for something else? Can we get get into a car that's autonomous drive and be part of an online yeah. meeting instead and share a video experience? Or can I, when I have ten minutes during the the soccer game of my children, can I watch that last episode of whichever series I'm watching for the time being okay. on the head <laughs> unit instead? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it drives a lot of, of creative possibilities on how you can use those screen in the cars in a different manner, mm. um, and how that can build a more intelligent e experience in the long run. And you have to solve the auto autonomous drive the autonomous well. drive is also on the <laughs> list of things needed to be solved right uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, talking about that i mean a lot about ai but uh, i know that you are also very passionate about how to manage the data so what what do you, would you say about the changes in uh, and the requirements to on data management now in yeah, the I think ai I, era yeah i get it i i um I think this is an extremely interesting area based on the fact that we've been talking data platform, data governance, and data mm. management mm. in a structured data context. And then suddenly what, what customers realize and as well we realize is that most of what you want to feed your Gen AI models with is actually unstructured data, meaning documents, tenders, legal documents, etc. Yeah. And what I foresee is, is, is basically a very probably a very quick shift from this data, a data platform is a structured store to something that is completely unstructured. You still have control, governance and security because you need all the things we learned mm. in the structured data platform, but you need to apply it in a world where data looks very different. Yep. And also <laughs> multimedia in terms of pictures, videos, etc. So it's going to be an interesting uh, thing. Mm. Istri Lots interesting is a, is a good word. <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> Thanks a lot and uh, happy to have you here and uh, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you. So coming up, uh, next speaker, our final speaker is uh, Megan Young, our own Megan Young from the Applied Innovation Exchange in the Nordics. Uh, she will take us on and share her mindset on how organizations should adopt to outmaneuver disruption and in their fields and not only survive but thrive. Welcome Megan. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, great. And uh, yeah, with no further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm here to talk about uh, data and generative AI as the fuel uh, for innovation. Uh, and as Magnus mentioned, my name is Megan Young, and I'm from Capgemini's Applied Innovation Exchange in the Nordics. Um, before we begin, just a quick disclaimer that I am not a tech expert. Uh, I am an expert in innovation and how to practice it to achieve uh, real value for your business. The Applied Innovation Exchange, or the AIE, 
has been tasked with orchestrating innovation across the Capgemini group, both with our clients, our colleagues, and our collaborators. And we're named for the three things that we stand for. Innovation that we see being the key for sustainable growth. An exchange, exchanging insights and collaborating, which is essential to stay ahead. And of course, without application, innovation is an empty endeavor. As Thomas mentioned earlier, innovation is indeed driven by business needs or human needs. And let's not forget that technology is nothing without the humans who use it. To ensure that our innovations may scale, we ground them in the DVF model, measuring their desirability, their viability, and their feasibility, and hopefully entering into that sweet spot of innovation that touches on all three aspects. Innovation requires knowledge. And at the AIE, we're in a unique position to gain this knowledge. We have an extensive global network of 22 different exchanges across the globe, each with its own innovation ecosystem of startups, academia, SMEs, and COEs, not to mention the clients that, that we work with. And we all work in a structured approach uh, towards realizing innovation through a foundation of structure and discipline. So I don't need to be a tech expert uh, to identify the value from innovation. And if we think back around 2023 and the generative AI hype, we can realize that we are in a unique era. It's bigger than the internet, uh, being adopted faster than ever previously seen, and it's here to stay. Generative AI will change and has changed everything. But where we will really see impact and acceleration is in the combination of data and artificial intelligence. Now, here are four ways that we see data and generative AI fueling innovation for our clients. Knowledge graphs. Let's look at generative AI's power in crafting and enriching knowledge graphs. Now, a knowledge graph is a powerhouse representation of interconnected information. It captures relationships and entities, the very essence of data semantics. And as we know, generative AI is a language ninja, navigating unstructured data sources, like tables found deep in Word documents, and laying the groundwork for a robust knowledge graph. If you imagine a complex automotive catalog containing thousands of parts, each with unique dependencies and relationships, generative AI can sift through these heaps of textual and contextual data, mapping a broad spectrum of relationships. Not only mapping these entities, but understanding the context in which these entities exist. The catalog of automotive parts. With the knowledge graph, you'll save time accessing the data, and you'll make the data more accessible to a broader audience, which can support rapid decision making. Generative design is emerging as a tool that will drive business optimization and push the boundaries of our own imagination. Architects, engineers, and designers will collaborate seamlessly with generative design systems, resulting in a myriad of designs, products, processes we've never dared to imagine. In the automotive world, generative design is a game changer, revolutionizing construction, considering intricacies like aerodynamics and structural integrity and material efficiency. Smaller models. As Ron Toledo, Toledo mentioned earlier, smaller models are an upcoming trend highlighted in Technovision, and for a good reason. We picture uh, a world where one size doesn't fit all in terms of AI, and smaller models are now working together. And they're not only smart, but they're nimble and agile. And as we enter a world where edge computing takes center stage, smaller models run locally on your devices, and so they're not as reliant on distant servers. 
but it's not about being cutting edge, but about being accessible, cost-effective, and ideal for places with limited resources. And going green, sustainability is very important now, and smaller AI models use less energy and are more environmentally friendly than their larger counterparts. Finally, we've been talking about the next steps from generative AI, and that's perceptive AI. And we're not just recognizing visuals, we're diving into reasoning and intelligence, intelligent decision-making, ushering in a new era of AI sophistication. Think about autonomous vehicles navigating a chaotic cityscape. AI perception goes beyond mere image recognition to reason through the environment, taking into account traffic patterns, pedestrian behavior, and making split-second decision, decisions based on a synthesis of visual and contextual data. It's clear that the convergence of AI and data is propelling machines into a realm of intelligence that not only mirrors, but surpasses human capabilities. And it's a journey towards machines thinking, reasoning, and ultimately contributing meaningfully to the challenges that we face. But now you might be wondering, how do organizations take advantage uh, of this space? And I have three tips for you. Move from the proof of concept to implementation. If 2023 was the year of the Gen AI proof of concept, then 2024 needs to be the age of implementation. We gain limited value from proofs of concepts, and we stand to gain new insights and reveal new business opportunities when we apply these technologies. Become data obsessed, even more data obsessed than you are. Um, play with your data, feed it to a secure Gen AI model and see what insights you can derive. Experiment and learn to stay ahead. And empower your employees. Upskill, uptask, upgrade your workforce so that you can position your organization uh, to thrive in this new tech landscape and not merely survive. And remember that innovation happens at the intersection of technology and human needs, and our ability to harness the power of innovation gives us the advantage. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Megan. Really, Thanks. really good. Really, really interesting. And I mean, innovation maybe be the most important part in uh, Gen AI. I think so, mm. but <laughs> <laughs> it is my trade. It's your trade, yes. <laughs> and I think maybe I have a bit of a tricky question for mm. you, but uh, the technology development is happening so super fast. Mm -hmm. And pretty much all companies and organizations, they have access more or less to the same tools. Mm -hmm. How would you then create competitive advantage when everybody ha have access to the same tool? That's a great question. Um, but I would say that it's not about the technology. No. It's yes. about what your business needs, where you find the value, what are the human needs within your, within your industry and your organization. Um, and it's also about uh, daring to experiment, daring to fail, and trying to... Uh, trying to innovate with these new emerging technologies to find out what works for you. Mm, good answer. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's all, I guess, for, for this part. That's and, it. And uh, now we've gotten at least uh, a glimpse on a few different important factors I in this area. And uh, we, we, we started out today with the collaborative ecosystems. And then we got a glimpse of insights into Polestar and what they are doing in AI. And of course, now the, the Gen AI uh, experiences from, from Microsoft and the innovation experience from you. So I think it's a super interesting time to be alive and working in this space. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And uh, this is the end of, of this uh, breakout, but there's more to follow. 
Do not miss the summary we will have now with the moderators, Rosa Senti and Thomas Vaughan, and I will be there as well. So join the main session and back to the studio. Thank you.